Hey, welcome to Hope Baltimore. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is a series that we've been in called Unbelief. This is week three. So I want to encourage you to go back and watch the previous two messages if you have not done so. This has been one of my favorite series that we have done. And the reason why is because everyone, including myself, struggles at certain points with unbelief. It shows up in our lives. Hey, we thought one thing, reality hits us, and then there's something else on the opposite end of it that was incongruent with what we thought before. And that's okay. And that's what this series is about, is to encourage us in our unbelief. So get your pens, your pencils, your devices, get ready to take notes. I hope you enjoy this message. Thanks for hanging out with us. So I'm a dad of four kids, which means I have spent over the years and still do right now a lot of time watching animated movies. And I've found over the years that God really speaks to me through Disney and Pixar. Maybe if you're a parent out there, you kind of understand what, what I'm saying. Um, but as I was thinking about this message for this week, um, I had a flashback actually to one of those movies that I've seen. Matter of fact, one of my favorite ones, uh, Despicable Me. It's now a series of movies. But in the first one that was introduced to us back in 2010, the protagonist in the movie uh, by the name of Gru, uh, he has a desire to be the world's top villain. Um, and so he's set himself up to try to become the greatest villain of all time by trying to capture the moon. Well, uh, he's also competing against a younger, even more skilled villain by the name of Vector. And his whole plan is to steal Vector's weapon so that he can capture the moon. And oh, by the way, he then adopts these three little girls along the way, hoping to use them as a pawn in his plan. They sell cookies. And so he thinks that he can use these girls to get into Vector's home, uh, spy out what he has so that he can steal uh, this weapon. Long story short, uh, if you haven't seen the movie, you should go see it or, or you should figure out how to watch it. But long story short, uh, Gru miscalculates this whole thing. And, and the plan is just completely ridiculous uh, to begin with. But we find out as the story goes on, that Gru's real motivation here is stemming back to his childhood. It's stemming back to his relationship with his mother who rejected him, who didn't affirm him, and who basically didn't think that any of his pursuits made sense. So basically, he's trying to still get the approval of his mother. Now, I know that this is a fictional a uh, movie, uh, it's a fictional plot, it's, it's an animated movie, but I think it's a familiar story that's played out in all of our lives and in the lives of people in and around us. And it's this idea that um, performance or belief that uh, performance and accomplishment and acquisition will fill us and validate us. Those are the metrics of evaluation in the world around us, in our culture, in this earthly kingdom that we live in. But the same metrics don't apply in God's kingdom. We try to apply these metrics though in the, in the same way. We, we think to ourselves, if we are good, if we perform, if we check all of the boxes, we can gain God's approval. We can gain his validation. And we've even equated blessings in our lives and the accumulation of things uh, and the cum accumulation of stuff as, as, as God's validation of us or approval of us. And we also think that by gaining these things that they can insulate us from drama and, and just the things that we might go through uh, in our lives. And to a certain extent, they do. But 
it's not a foolproof plan. I, it, no amount of money or uh, affluence or any of those sorts of things can stop certain things from happening in our lives. And so whether you follow hip hop theology, uh, what do I mean by that? Well, there's a guy by the name of Notorious B.I.G. who said more money, more problems. So he's clearly telling us that it doesn't matter how much money you have. It just means you will have more problems to deal with. Or if you follow Christian theology, Jesus himself said in this life, you will have trouble. So whichever end of the spectrum you're on and whatever you follow, clearly the memo is it doesn't matter. Like you're going to have some issues and some dramas and you can't be completely insulated and isolated from these sorts of things. And I think if we think back and we really process what we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks, which is this, this thing about unbelief, when we, when we trace back and we think about the origins or, or where unbelief comes from or to, what, to whatever extent, one of the potential reasons for unbelief in our lives is, is us embracing an idea of, or, or I should say, we have embraced an idea of who we think God is and what he wants, a an incorrect idea of who God is and what God wants. And ultimately, it is a misinterpretation and a miscalculation that leads to unbelief in our lives. And I want to unpack a little bit of that for us uh, in this message uh, we're continuing the series, as I just mentioned, called Unbelief, uh, about uh, doubt and faith and, and how you can have both of those. And we, we live in uh, that tension. This week, we're going to focus in on a story in Luke uh, chapter number 18. And this particular story is, is mentioned in all of, uh, of the Gospels. But before we do that, let's just do a quick recap. Um, week one, I talked about embracing the tension and this this whole idea that doubt is not the enemy of faith we all have unbelief and it's okay to be honest with god about our unbelief just like the man uh in week one that we talked about whose son had an illness told jesus hey i believe but help my unbelief then uh week two which was Previous to this message, um, my friend, Pastor Charlie Mitchell from Epiphany, Baltimore, uh, talked about the Thomas dilemma. Thomas was one of Jesus's uh, disciples, and he talked to us about going from simplicity in our lives to complexity. Complexity is when we just experience a whole bunch of things that hit us that um, don't really uh, look like what we thought things would look like coming from a, a simplistic uh, viewpoint. We hit these moments of complexity, but if we're able to come out on the opposite end of it, we can gain clarity. And he told us that crisis is the entry point for many of us to unbelief, but it's also an opportunity for mature belief if we're able to wade through the crisis and the complexity that we face. This week, I want to um, talk about this particular story in Luke chapter number 18 about a young, affluent guy uh, who has a conversation with Jesus. And it's an interesting conversation that I want to dive into that I think really um, touches on another aspect of this theme about unbelief. Go with me to Luke chapter 18. We'll start at verse 18. You can follow along with me. It says, a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And so this ruler is a young guy who has a lot of influence, uh, has a lot of affluence as well. And so he asked Jesus, what must I do to internal, in, uh, inherit eternal life? Verse 19, why do you call me good? Jesus asked him, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. I have kept all of these from my youth, he said. When Jesus heard this, he told him, you still lack one thing. 
sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. After he heard this, he became extremely sad because he was very rich. I want to use for a uh, subject for this message uh, in this third part of this series, Unbelief, uh, this title, Miscalculated Belief. Miscalculated Belief, which is what I believe this, this young, affluent uh, person of influence had. Now, we can all think about situations and circumstances in our lives when we have had significant miscalculations. Uh, we, didn't, we entered into a situation thinking one thing, but the reality of what actually happened or on the opposite end of that was something very different. This uh, young man is called uh, or known as a rich young ruler. And what that means is that he was someone in the culture in society who had a lot of influence and a lot of affluence. He was probably not Roman um, because it would have been unlikely for uh, someone in Rome um, to uh, uh, or a Roman citizen to approach Jesus and ask about eternal life. So this was someone who probably had knowledge of what that meant. Uh, so he probably was Jewish, may have even been someone connected to um, the, the synagogue. But we don't really know a lot about him other than his his status um, in life. But but this this young guy, he, he thinks that he has all of his ducks in a row and whatever isn't in a row or whatever it isn't together, he can fix it. He can pull it together and uh, it, it'll be all good. But he does not anticipate Jesus's response to his question. And it absolutely floors him now. In week one of this series, I talked about how unbelief really kind of stems from um, or is related to, I think, two things, generally speaking, unmet expectations or unverified evidence. So those are kind of the two categories. And I think this story really kind of falls underneath the first category of unmet expectations because this young guy uh, has an expectation or, or, or an anticipated response that he does not get. And I want to highlight three reasons why I, I think that he's floored by Jesus's answer or response to him. Num number one, and the first thing that I think happens here or that's revealed to us in this exchange is the rich young ruler has an incorrect mindset. He he has an in, incorrect mindset. And, and sometimes, you know, when you have conversations with people and you engage with them, you, you can kind of pick up on what's happening with their mindset, or you just have interactions with them and you can kind of see very quickly like, oh, they thought this, but actually um, it was it was this thing over here. They, they didn't anticipate that. I'm thinking of one situation I had with a young guy who uh, I have the privilege of mentoring. Uh, he's a senior in high school right now. I've been with him since he's in the eighth grade. And uh, I remember, I believe it was like the beginning or going into his sophomore year. So about a couple of years ago, um, I wanted to take him to uh, a workout that one of my former teammates was putting together. And it was a bunch of athletes and um, it was, you know, getting ready for the upcoming season. And uh, so I said, hey, we're going to go out to this workout. My guy didn't last 15 minutes, y'all. He didn't last 15 minutes in his work. You know why? Because he thought that he could just sit on his couch and he could just chill out and he could just go out there whenever he wanted. And it would be all good, even though he hadn't been doing anything to get himself ready. And. The reality of the situation knocked him on his butt. And I think he was actually throwing up, y'all. But he learned from that situation. When we look at this situation here in Luke 18, I think um, the question that the rich young ruler asked gives us an indication of his mindset. He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life. The problem with this question is he's assuming that eternal life can be earned or it has to do with works. Now he's 
likely based his whole entire life on performance um, or the accumulation of things. He's he's obviously got a lot of things. And this is no different, I think, to our cultural mindset. We have a culture that's based upon uh, performance and performance and what we achieve and what we accomplish is how value is derived and it is assigned. And I think the challenge with this is some of us are trying to earn God's approval in the same way through works. Yes, there are things that we should do. Jesus in his interaction with this young man even mentions the commandments. So yes, those are important things, but those should be an outflow from our hearts, not a to-do list in our heads. And if we're honest, most of our actions are about doing for God than being with God. And we've based our entire spiritual maturity on that knowledge and action. And it's not that those things are bad, but that's not the prioritization that Jesus has and is not paramount in God's kingdom. And it's obvious that this was the mindset of this rich young ruler. The second thing that I think we can extract from this exchange that this young man has with Jesus is not only that he has an incorrect mindset, but he has inaccurate metrics. Now, what we measure and how we measure is an indication of what actually matters to us. Jesus responds to the rich young ruler about commandments, which uh, we see are his metrics. This is how he's measuring. Verse 21, he says, I have kept all of the commandments since my youth. Again, it seems like his evaluation is solely based on performance. This is the second example that we can see of this. He also assumes that uh, doing well in this one particular area um, translates or uh, is equivalent to something over here or is going to get him what he uh, is searching for. And that doesn't necessarily uh, happen and isn't necessarily the case. Just because we have success in one area doesn't translate or doesn't equate uh, in another area. I'm going to just give you a real practical example. Uh, about a couple of weeks ago, uh, or maybe even a week ago, I went duck pin bowling. I, I had no context for what duck pin bowling is. I, I know it's bowling, but it's this, it's a much smaller ball that you can just literally hold in your hand like this, maybe a little bit bigger than a softball. And, and you have these little small pins um, and there, there are 10 of them. And instead of two rows, like in regular bowling, you have three rows. And the more and more I, uh, you know, engaged in this duck pin bowling, I could see and understand why they give you three rows. And I've also come to the conclusion as a pretty decent bowler myself, that it's almost impossible to get a strike in duck pin bowling. I thought that I would use the same strategies in regular bowling, uh, in duck pin bowling, uh, nothing worked. Clearly there has to be a different strategy. Clearly I need a lot more practice in duck pin bowling uh, to be successful. And I walked away like this rich young ruler, very disappointed in my performance because being a decent bowler in regular bowling, it didn't translate to success in duck pin bowling. It was a complete miscalculation on my part. I, I think that we are the same way in our lives, particularly for those of us who are uh, trying to be people of God, trying to follow Jesus. I, I think some of our metrics are a little off and we think like, oh, if I'm just nice to people, or if I just give money, or if I just volunteer, or if I just check the boxes of, of, of showing up 